Since Game of Thrones finished tearing back in 2019, many publications have been clamoring for the next big thing. Much like the next big lost phase in the mid-2000s, finding that Ilias of Lightning in a Bottle again is all the fantasy craze right now. While The Witcher released on Netflix and did a solid job adapting both the book and game, becoming a sort of hybrid Frankenstein's monster of the pair, rumblings about the Wheel of Time were always in the periphery vision for many enthusiasts of the genre. With the might of Amazon Studios and an eye-watering $90 million budget to play with, Robert Jordan's fantasy epic look set to light the platform up in a big way. Originally The Wheel of Time was planned to be adapted into a movie adaptation by Universal Studios in 2004 and, since then this IP hot potato has been pushed and pulled between different studios, eventually landing with Amazon as an eight-episode series. At its best, The Wheel of Time faithfully captures the wonder and visual beauty of fantasy worlds to perfection, far whale and look both enticing and rich with lore. At its worst, this first season makes Game of Thrones Season 8 look like a masterpiece. The Wheel of Time is, for the most part, okay. It's not disastrously terrible, and it's not particularly amazing either. It's a proverbial muted shrug in an otherwise animated crowd, a fantasy show that exists and serves its purpose to entertain, but struggles to hit the cultural impact on the medium many people predicted. As someone who has read half of the first book, and actively engaged with many avid book readers and fans of the genre, The Wheel of Time essentially takes the core essence of Robert Jordan's novels and rips it out, replaced with generic fantasy fluff and big narrative, structural and character changes that do absolutely nothing but harm the story. Worldbuilding aside, the finale in particular is a classic example of how not to write fantasy, and it really is an awful way to end what's otherwise a perfectly acceptable season of entertainment. This first season was always going to draw comparisons to Lord of the Rings, just because of how similar in structure the Eye of the World, Book 1, is to Fellowship of the Ring. So for that, some leniency can be taken over the main narrative pull of this one. At the center of this is the Dark One, a powerful force that threatens to engulf the world into darkness, unless the dragon reborn, a prophetic magic wielder in a world dominated by mages called Aes Sedai, can restore balance and thwart the shadows. Five young men and women are our main protagonists, Matt, Rand, Perrin, Nin, and Egwene. One among them is destined to be this dragon reborn. But which one? This question forms the glue that holds the whole series together, as an Aes Sedai by the name of Warain travels to two rivers to recruit them and embark on this perilous journey across the world to the White Tower. The pacing of the Wheel of Time story also leaves a lot to be desired. After rocketing through its first chapter at breakneck speed, the subsequent four episodes then play catch-up, screeching to a halt and trying to build up affection for these characters. All the while though, new races, ideas, locations and mythology is thrown in the mix. There's even a big funeral for a character we've barely spent any time with too, and half of that particular episode is dedicated to mourning this stranger. There really are some odd choices made with this one. While the visuals are pretty and there's some gorgeous costuming, the crucial parts of the story like empathizing with characters, getting invested in this world and feeling real threat for these characters is completely lost. By the end of the first season there's absolutely no reason to care about Perrin, who does barely anything of note all season long. Likewise, the series also throws a last-minute deus ex machina device our way, which not only undermines what's happened prior to that, it also eliminates the threat of death too. I'm trying not to go into spoiler territory here, but it really is bad. That's to say nothing of the questionable way the main antagonists are handled this season. Trollocs and Fades are supposed to be world-ending menaces, and yet inexperienced magic wielders can take them down, wipe out armies, and brush aside their threat. And yet, an episode either side of that chapter may portray one or two as menacing enough to wipe out a whole human army. This inconsistency plagues the show all the way through its eight episodes, culminating in a disastrous and disappointing finale. Normally I wouldn't go so hard on a show, but The Wheel of Time is a $90 million venture that should have done much better than this. Had this been a low-budget affair like the Shannara Chronicles, then the issues could have been forgiven, but Wheel of Time is an expensive project that struggles to rise above mediocrity. Despite my big gripes with this, there's definitely enough here to like. 
the world looks amazing, the acting is pretty good, and there's a consistency to the story that whisks you off to numerous different areas. At times that pacing actually helps paper over some of the issues, and watching as a binge watch rather than stewing over the events of an episode or two does help. But as we've seen from Foundation earlier this year, pretty visuals and a competent enough story isn't enough to stand out next to so many other amazing shows on TV right now. The wheel will keep on turning and fantasy efforts will come and go. The Wheel of Time is not one that will be sorely missed, but will undoubtedly build up a good buzz for a second season. That buzz though will mostly be from fans eager to see if the series can rectify the damage done from its truly disastrous finale. A final episode that's somehow worse than Game of Thrones Season 8? That certainly takes some do- Leave taking, Episode 1 of The Wheel of Time begins with War Ain, one of the A's sad eye, preparing for the coming of the dragon. This child, whomever it is, must be found before the Dark Lord does. This world is full of magic, typified by Leandrin Girail, a red-robed woman who hunts several men across the rocky wilderness. This man seems to be possessed with magical powers, but he struggles to control it, seeing images of an elderly chap by his side. This happens to be a hallucination though, and it's enough incentive for Leandrin to begin torturing him. High above those stands Moiraine, whose Adam and this isn't the man they're after. Instead, they're bound for the Two Rivers, a quaint little medieval village where it's rumored that four tavern have just started to come of age. These four happen to be 20-year-old Farmer Rand, his longtime companions Perrin and Matt, and the headstrong Egwene. There's a lot of drinking, a lot of laughter and a lot of good times being shared. That is, until Lan and Moiraine show up and spoil the party. As the ace sad eye settles in, paying her way for a room, she looks over our diverse rabble of characters before heading upstairs. While this is going on, there's a romance brewing between Perrin and Lila, who totally rip off Star Wars through their I love you, I know routine, while Rand and Egwene wind up kissing next to all the washing up. Kissing turns into so much more, though but unbeknownst to them, a strange shadowy figure, whom we later find out as a murderer or a fate as is referenced here, watches over this village from afar. Nin is not exactly taken with Moiraine's presence, and there's no love lost between them when the pair talk. As we soon find out, Nin's adoptive mother was cruelly turned away by the A's sad eye after traveling by foot all the way to their headquarters, the White Tower. For now, their conversation is left ominously teetering on a knife edge. Lan finds an ominous omen out in the woods. A whole flock of sheep are mutilated, left in an unnerving circle on the ground. A puddle of blood surrounds them. This warning arrives too late, as Lan approaches Moiraine, and urges her to leave. Trollocs are coming. While a festival gets underway, celebrating the passing of the deceased, everything comes to a devastatingly abrupt end. These Trollocs, engineered soldiers that are a fuse of man and beast, begin slaughtering the townsfolk. Tam squares off against a lone Trolloc, but it's Rand who hits the killer blow. Unfortunately, Tam is badly wounded in the ensuing skirmish, poisoned with a Trolloc blade. Moiraine shows up with her op magic level, and makes short work of these grunts, turning the tide of battle and granting these villagers the courage to fight back. At least, to begin with anyway. When reinforcements show, Moiraine takes a blade to the shoulder for her troubles, she does manage her to conjure enough magic to take out the Trollocs approaching, but the damage has already been done. Two Rivers is a smoldering mess. The village is full of casualties, Nin has disappeared, and Tam is suffering badly from the Trolloc poison. Moiraine manages to purge the poison, but there's bigger problems at play here. Moiraine turns to the others and tells them that the Trollocs have arrived for the same reason she and Lan have. One among them is the Dragon Reborn and with 300 Trolloc inbound, the four need to leave. If they stay, they could well be killed. There's no time, and they need to go now before the army are Shadows Waiting, Episode 2 of The Wheel of Time begins with a look at the Children of Light. Led by the enigmatic Eamon Valda, this man burns an A's said eye and watches in satisfaction as she burns to death. He's been collecting rings from these sisters too, and it seems it's only a matter of time before he closes in on Warane. Meanwhile, Warane, Lan and the kids hurry to the nearby town, Terran Ferry. They need to cross and now. 
The only thing that stops Trollocs is deep water, and as they leave the shore, Trollocs arrive in their numbers and head down to the dock. Dancing torches light the horizon as that same fade the Shadow Rider we saw outside Two Rivers last episode shows, piercing the air with a sickening shriek. These highly intelligent creatures serve the Dark Lord, and for now, Warane and the others have managed to avoid a close encounter. Not willing to risk another encounter, Lan and Warane cut the ropes tethering the ferry, being sure to disband it in a magical whirlpool to avoid the Trollocs from crossing. The ferryman is livid and cursing his luck, calling out the A's said I as being cruel. This singular axe leaves a big impression on the kids, who start questioning Warane, and what she'll do if one of them steps out of line. Warane does eventually explain her actions, talking to Egwene in private. The conversation is a simple one and paves way for her quizzing Egwene about the one power, something that comes naturally to women in this world. This comes in the form of a spark, meaning Egwene will channel her magic one day, whether she wants to learn it or not. That evening, all the kids wind up experiencing a frightening dream about bats and a strange man with red eyes. When Warane learns of this, she's very clearly concerned and demands the kids follow her for the time being. They're heading east to the White Tower, but Rand is not happy about playing errand boy. He defiantly stays where he is and questions Warane's ruling. Egwene calls Rand out for his childishness and points out how Warane is using her powers to keep them alive, even at the expense of her own strength. On the way though, they run into the Children of the Light, these white cloaks that certainly have no love lost for a Sedai. Eamon leads the charge, throwing shade on Warane's story and pointing out how eight sisters were originally dispatched. He thinks she could be one of them until Warane shows off her Trolloc wound. Now, the A said I may be able to heal others, but they can't heal themselves, which is a pretty inconvenient weakness. Lucky for her though, it's a convenient wound to show to the White Cloaks to gain safe passage without bloodshed. She also tells them they've come from Terran Ferry, and while their story does allow them to continue on their way, a shifty side-eyed glance from Eamon is unnerving enough not to let any of them get too comfortable. Warane is no fool and she speaks to Lan later on about this encounter. The man had seven rings, and that means Eamon is closing in on the final sister that being Warane herself. How long will she be able to hold out? With Trolloc and Fade running wild, ambushing the gang that evening, White bridges out the question. Instead, the group head up to the abandoned and very cursed Shader Logoth, which means shadows waiting. With Moraine passed out and riding with Lan, he makes the call to head inside. The walls tower over them all as the place is eerily quiet. This area is watched over by a shapeless evil called Mashader, and its presence can be felt everywhere. There's no birds, bugs or greenery here, cold, hard stone is their only refuge. The Shadowspin fear to enter and this place is incredibly cursed. Lan and Warain warn the kids not to touch anything. So naturally Matt heads out at night and begins sniffing around. In the rubble, he comes across a beautiful but deadly dagger. Unsheathing the blade, this singular action sees one horse suddenly disintegrate and turn to ash. Shadows begin stirring in the night as Moraine, still struggling from her wounds, awakens long enough to tell Lan he's doomed them all. These shadows dance off the walls and floor, serving as a quicker and more energetic version of the Vashti Narada. Shout out to fellow Doctor Who fans for that quote regarding those ravenous evil shadows. Thankfully the gang managed to make it to safety, but everyone is separated in the ensuing chaos. Lan and Warane slip away into the woods, Rand and Matt edge through a crack in the wall, while Perrin and Egwene plunge into the water below, after plunging off the top of the walls. As the episode closes out, Nin returns and holds a knife up to Lan's neck, demanding to be taken to the others. A place of safety, episode 3 of The Wheel of Time begins with Nin slipping away from her Trolloc captors. She's chased through the woods, as loud growls pierce the air, threatening to close in on her. Nin keeps her nerve though, hiding in the water at the women's circle, before pouncing on this Trolloc and taking it out. This catches us up to the cliffhanger at the end of episode 2, as Nin confronts Lan. The darkness is coming for them, he warns, going on to suggest she heal Moraine. After all, Nin is a healer. If she doesn't do this then Rand, and the others will remain lost. 
Speaking of lost, Matt and Rand wind up out in the wilderness alone, heading up to the rocky hills and calling out for the others. It's no good, they're nowhere to be found. However, they know their destination, so the pair decide to walk on to White Tower. On the way, Matt and Rand come across a pretty inhospitable place, Breen Spring, complete with a caged warrior stuck with several arrows through the gut. It's an unwelcome greeting, and one that paves way for the pair heading into this bustling market and looking around. Matt learns a harsh lesson, courtesy of a bard who robs him. In need of funds, the pair bag themselves some work, in order to stay the night. Matt begins to despair though, believing Rand is following a fool's errand, and questioning the Dragon Reborn prophecy completely. The barmaid, Dana, puts the boys to work though, with Matt's stubbornness eventually seeing him waiting tables inside. While Rand is given safe refuge and a place to stay, Matt meets Tom Marilyn, who's pretty sharp and questions Matt about what he's doing. He knows the boy is from Two Rivers but beyond that, Matt manages to dance his way through the questions and eventually takes the gem from the deceased in the cage. However, Rand realizes he's been played by Dana and after using his powers to break down a seemingly impregnable door, Matt and Rand find themselves cornered. That is, until Tom stabs her through the throat. Dana has called a fate to town and that's bad news. Tom is heading east, though, and implores the pair to follow. Unless they'd rather stick around and wait for the fate, of course. Perrin and Egwene, meanwhile, are stalked by a pack of wolves. Perrin struggles to light a flint to get a fire going, so interestingly Egwene uses her spark to conjure forth a fire for them. As they sit under the dancing light, Egwene believes Rand's heading back to two rivers until Perrin sets her right. The pack of wolves close in, though, forcing them on. They eventually make it to a caravan of nomadic people, sometimes referred to as Tuathian, or the traveling people. They offer food and refuge for the pair. With Moraine slowly on the mend, she, Lan and Nin ride on, and are greeted by Leandrin. She tells them they're too late, gloating about capturing him and calling himself the Dragon Reborn. That man is Logain of Lar, and as he looks up at the others, the episode comes to a close. The Dragon Reborn, Episode 4 of The Wheel of Time begins in Gildan with the king and his guards, all four of them, under attack from magic-wielding Logain Ablar. When he catches up to the king, he warns that the A's said I will be after him soon. Logain scoffs, claiming they should be following him. The strange ethereal voice of a woman called Alusha bleeds through, coming in the form of wisps of black smoke. It convinces Logain to kill the king. Instead he heals the man's wounds and encourages the guy to join his side. There's a place at my side. Even for enemies this cuts us forward to the present, as Moraine joins the other A's Sedai as they trap Loghain in a special magical cage. There, she learns from the others that Loghain is proclaiming himself to be the Dragon Reborn. He's got thousands of followers too and is a visible threat. With the A's Sedai gathered, they decide to take him to the White Tower for trial. However, even though he may not be the dragon, he's still incredibly powerful and Moraine realizes that too. They need to be vigilant. Perrin and Egwene find themselves with the caravan. There are little other options for them here, so they decide to set out with them. The caravan are bound by the way of the leaf, which is a pacifist lifestyle practiced by seekers. Basically, if they're attacked they run, but don't hit back. That evening, under the starlight, there are really beautiful chat between Nile and Perrin as they discuss this, specifically about the nature of living for peace rather than revenge. At the same time, Matt and Rand contemplate over more A.N.S. words regarding five of them being Dragon Reborn. So who is this fifth person? Well, it appears to be Logain. However, out in the woods they meet a farmhand and pay their way to stay the night. Of course, that means doing some heavy manual labor. Matt though begins to hallucinate. Leandrin, the red-robed woman who hunted that man in the first episode, approaches Nin outside the cave to talk. However, Nin is incredibly untrusting and immediately puts her defenses up. When she leaves, Nin calls her a snake. However, the one person she lets her defenses down with happens to be Lan, whom she starts to grow closer to. That night, Nin joins the warders, who live at the White Tower, and have formed a brotherhood together. 
while there's laughter and joy, Nin turns the mood when she asks about serving the A's Sedai. The night grows later, the group depart, and Lan approaches Moiraine. He asks whether Loghain is stronger than Egwene and they discuss the idea of him being the dragon, meanwhile, everything at the farm goes horribly wrong. Matt seems to be infected, holding that jewel knife from episode 2 and pointing it at the darkness. Rand and Tom rush in to see him. I see you, he whispers, as a fade appears out the shadows. Tom stays behind to fight, while Rand joins Matt as they rush away. Unfortunately, in Matt's possessed state, he has also slaughtered everyone at the farm too. Elsewhere, the A's said I find themselves cornered as Loghain's army closes in. A volley of arrows greet them, which is quickly thwarted by the sisters. Loghain himself awakens, though and blasts two of the sisters back. The thing is, Loghain has numerous followers, and as the group head into the woods, they do their best to fight back against the army. But it seems there are too many of them. Loghain breaks free from his cage, and come face to face with Moiraine. Why should I believe you're the dragon reborn? She quizzes. All of this is a ruse to distract Loghain and bring up the cage once more. The thing is, one of the sisters is killed and Leandrin begins to burn out. When Maxim, one of the warders, jumps in, he ends up getting killed. So too is Lan, as he begins bleeding out. Nin sees this and screams to the heavens, managing to conjure a huge blast of energy that makes others question whether she could be the Blood Calls Blood, Episode 5 of The Wheel of Time begins with the aftermath of last episode's bloodshed. One of the A's said I is dead, and Nin joins Lan, Warren and the others as they lay her to rest. May the last embrace of the mother welcome you home, Warren says, bending down and gently placing the fallen in a grave. A grave that's positioned in a semicircle, reinforcing that the wheel continues to turn. We then cut forward one month later. Loghain is still a prisoner and the A's said I ride to the White City, Tar Valen. This beautiful metropolis is overshadowed by the White Tower of course. Alone, Moiraine speaks to Nin about her place in the world, or lack thereof. After catching a glimpse of her real power last episode, she's now just starting to understand how powerful she is, or could become. Moiraine warns her not to wander off and get involved in tower politics, following that up with a promise of bringing her friends into the city. Well, she doesn't have to wait for long as a very erratic Matt arrives in town with Rand. As they walk through the bustling streets, holding over 500,000 people from all regions of the world, they rest up for the night. Alone, Matt admits that he's haunted by what happened to Tom and the Fade, blaming himself. Heading out to town, Rand runs into an Ogier known as Loyal, son of Arendt, son of Hallam. But we'll just call him Loyal for this recap. Anyway, he's this world's form of ogre, and he's a pretty inquisitive creature, asking about Rand's purpose in Tar Valen. Only, he's interrupted by a big parade in town. It's the A's said I, and they've arrived to show off the false prophet. This, of course, is Loghain. Vegetables are thrown at the cage, but he does not stir. However, when the prisoner spies Matt sitting on the balcony, he suddenly starts giggling hysterically, with big, jeweled eyes dancing evilly at the sight of this potential dragon. Does he know something we don't? Elsewhere, Perrin gets talking to Aram about the way of the Seekers. The irony of course is that despite them not willing to engage in violence, their dogs are pretty savage and kill what they find in the wilderness. The caravan though is stopped by the Children of the Light, led by the wickedly deceptive Eam and Valva. Sensing danger, Aram takes Perrin and Egwene away in the opposite direction through the woods until they're stopped by the Children of the Light. We catch up with these guys later in the episode, as Egwene is washed, dressed in white and forced to watch as Perrin is brought in and tortured in front of her. Apparently they're under trial by the Light, with Valda serving as judge, jury and executioner. He's convinced that Perrin is a warder and Egwene is an A's said I, demanding that she channel. While all this is going on, the story slows down in the White City. Stephen is having trouble sleeping, still mourning his loss. Nin finds Rand and Matt again, but the former is troubled, especially as Matt slipping deeper into dark despair. Another that slipping is Perrin, who blames himself for killing his wife. He believes he deserves death, just as Valda shows, and decides to grant that wish for him. 
with a knife in hand, Eamon Balda starts to slice his back open, prompting Egwene to use her powers after all. Only, Perrin too manages to use his powers, allowing the bonds to break. With Balda caught off guard, he's bested as Perrin seemingly controls the animals outside, allowing them to break free and escape. Back in the city, Warren gets talking to Alana Masvani. Now, apparently the Amerlin is returning from Kemlin, and she's summoned the pair to the hall to discuss Loghain's fate. Alana tells Moiraine that she's the only one strong enough to challenge her, and Alana wants her to rise up and meet that. If not, she needs to be careful. Change is afoot in this world, and as all our characters prepare for what's to come next, the wheel continues to turn. The Flames of Tar Valen, Episode 6 of The Wheel of Time, begins at a place known as the Fingers of the Dragon, in the Nation of Tyr. This vast connection of waterways is occupied by a young Sion Sanch and her father Burden. Sion exhibits signs of wielding the One Power, which is forbidden to be used here, so she's forced to leave. Fast forward to present A and RA's said I all arrive at the White Tower, fronted by none other than Sion Sanch. She sits in the Amerlin seat, the head of all A's said I. She commands Loghain to be brought in. He pleads to be killed, but instead he's taken away and imprisoned. In his absence, Leandrin takes the brunt of the blame for mishandling their magic powers. After the death of one of their own, using magic to subdue him goes against A's said I ways. When Leandrin learns she's going to get punished, she shifts the blame across to Moiraine and throws shade at her actions. When Moiraine is questioned though, she refuses to disclose the purpose of her travels. Sion interprets that as a challenge. For now they're to wait 24 hours, and then judgment will be served. After their frosty meeting, Lan brings Moiraine to Matt and Rand. When Rand confirms that Matt has been delirious and in a bad state for a month, Moiraine works her magic. She finds the dagger taken from Shader Logoth and uses her magic to take out the tainted evil within. Moiraine also catches wind of Egwene and Perrin being alive and within the city. She hurries down to see them, where Egwene reveals what happened with Perrin's eyes turning orange and controlling the wolves. For now, Moiraine tells her to sit tight, imploring Egwene not to tell anyone where she's going when she summons her the following day. That night though, Moiraine goes to see Sion. It turns out these two are actually romantically linked, and it eventually leads to her admitting that she's found the four kids who could well be the dragon reborn. Debates rage between them over whether to actually tell the others this or not. The thing is, if the other A's said I find out they're working together, it could undermine everything they're doing. In the morning, Warain brings Egwene to the hall. Nin is there too, but because we've had so little time with these characters together, the reunion sorta of falls flat emotionally. Anyway, the two women are brought before Sion. The final battle is coming and they need to be ready, especially as they're allegedly the strongest channelers they've seen in thousands of years. The time comes for Moiraine's judgment to be passed. The A said I gather as Moiraine is exiled from the tower. As she rides out, all our characters join ours too, reunited once more. Mad is absolutely fine now, so I guess that's that then, and the others are all happy to see one another. Lan joins them of course, alongside Loyal, as they find out their destination is the Eye of the World. The Dark One's prison lies there, and whoever this Dragon Reborn is, their task with finishing the job and stopping him before the darkness spreads across the world and destroys everything. As everyone enters the portal conjured forth by Moiraine, Matt stays behind, much to the horror of all inside this portal. The Dark Along the Ways, Episode 7 of The Wheel of Time begins with a woman called Tigrain Mantier rushing through the snow. This is the Battle of the Shining Walls, the final battle that ended the Ale War. Under the shadow of a massive volcano, she single-handedly takes out a whole bunch of soldiers while heavily pregnant. However, she's stabbed in the side for her troubles, despite killing all of these men. Well, all but one anyway. As she looks up at a lonely blade pressing down, the scene cuts. Meanwhile, Matt's decision to stay behind has far-reaching consequences. The way gate can't be reopened, but Nin promises the others that when this is all over, they'll go back and find him. Moiraine though is concerned. Given Matt was seduced by the dark magic in the blade, if he's the dragon reborn, she's not going to let him near the Dark Lord no matter what. 
According to her, she knows what choice he would make. There in the ways, a mysterious gateway of sorts that connects numerous different islands with bridges. On the way, they find a defaced guiding stone. It would appear that there's something following them, but unfortunately with the stone scratched up, Loyal needs more time to decipher it and figure out which way they need to go. So for now, they need to hang tight. In the middle of the night, or later on, it's hard to say given it's always dark here, a single trollock arrives and confronts them. The gang realize they need to leave, and quickly. As they cross a thin bridge, a black wind swarms around them called Match and Shin, whispering to them and taunting the gang over the choices they've made thus far in this journey. Nin is there, though and manages to hold it off by using her powers. It's enough time for Moiraine to conjure up a portal and escape. This barren, deserted landscape they arrive in plays host to the fortress city of Faldara. Together, the gang head inside the palace, completely unchecked or stopped I may add, and meet Lord Angelmerge Agad, the man in charge. Moiraine warns him that the Dark One is massing an army. All she asks is that men keep watch at the Faldara Waygate. In confidence, Moiraine speaks to Lady Amalissa, asking her for help in finding Matt. She wants the message sent along to the Red Ajah. With the wheels set into motion, Moiraine decides to take the three remaining kids to the eye, intent on finding out who the Dragon Reborn really is. And they leave at dawn. When she leaves them to their thoughts, the kids begin to doubt Moiraine's prophecy. Egwene is the one clinging to hope here, as Nin exhibits her doubts over the whole journey. When the attention turns to Matt, and whether he could be the Dragon Reborn, the kids all fall out and begin arguing. As things simmer down, Nin heads out in the night and follows Lan. Watching from the window, she sees him sitting at the table with a family, eating. He's well aware of what she's doing, and invites her in to join them. After a nice meal, Lan leads Nin back inside the fortress. As the sparks of sexual energy crackle between them, Nin and Lan hook up that night. After the implied sex between them, sitting on the edge of the bed, the pair talk about the fate of the world and destiny. Specifically that of Lan, and what's brought him here, and who the family was that they shared food with. Nin understand Lan's desire to find a place to fit in and belong, which is why he's so loyal to Moiraine. After patching up his differences with Egwene, Rand ends up having frightening visions that night, bringing him to Min Farshaw, the woman whom Moiraine spoke with earlier in the episode about the kids. Now, she's seen visions of a baby born on the mountaintop, linking back to those scenes at the start of the episode. It turns out this babe was raised by the soldier as his own son in the wake of her death. Whoever that child is, they're the dragon reborn. When Rand asks if he makes it back from the eye of the world, the silence is deafening and speaks for itself. Rand interprets this as a sign that he's the dragon reborn. When he tells Moiraine, she takes him out to the Blight, a large gnarly desert of trees full of skeletal remains and darkness. She's taking him to the eye and leaving the other. The Eye of the World, Episode 8 of The Wheel of Time begins in the past with Latra and Luz talking in the old tongue about the future of the A's said I. Latra throws shade at the men, worried that their mission to imprison the Dark One is too dangerous. As the camera pans out, we also learn that Luz is actually the Dragon Reborn. Back in the present, Rand and Warane walk through the thick brambles known as the Great Blight. These gnarly twisting forests stretch on for miles, growing ever larger every year as the Dark One's power grows. While they walk, Egwene begins packing up her things, desperate to follow them. It's Nin who has the trump card though, admitting to Lan she's able to follow Moiraine, given she has a tell. A. Eh? When did this come into play? When did Nin manage to learn how to track her? Am I missing something? And how has Lan not noticed this same tell? Anyway, Lan holds her hands, calling her a remarkable woman, and setting out to track the pair of them down. However, they don't have to wait for long before things escalate in a big way. As horns blow in town, sixty fades and numerous more trollocs are inbound to their location. The gap is unlikely to hold and they're bound to be overwhelmed, but that doesn't stop those at the fortress from working hard to prepare for what they've colloquially called the last battle. Lady Amalus and Lord Ajelmer prepare for battle, determined to hold the gap. If that should fall, then it's up to the women to hold the city. This confidence is but a facade though, 
Azajelmer knows that the Dark One's power is too great, too immeasurable to stop. Still, he'll head into battle nonetheless and face the armies, in the hopes of at least slowing down the growing plague that's sweeping this world. Meanwhile, Rand is confronted all alone by a being known as the Man. He steps out of the shadows, stabbing Warren through the mouth, leaving her a bloody mess on the floor. He also calls Rand by the name of Luz and chuckles when Rand brandishes his father's blade. The man taunts him about his true ancestry and promises to tell him about the dragon. Only, all of this is one big dream, as Rand stabs himself and awakens. Moiraine and Rand press on, eventually making it to a gaping hole, complete with stairs leading down. With the area completely unguarded, Rand makes it to the eye, a yin-yang symbol on the floor, an island surrounded by a pool of water. As he touches it, Rand descends into a vision. With him stuck in this dream world, the Dark One materializes before Moiraine and taunts her with his power. He also seduces Rand too, freezing the vision of him and Egwene together, and trying to convince him to use this power he has to remake the world as he sees fit. Back at the city, as the Trollocs fast approach, Nin and Egwene join the fight, and decide to use their powers to help the other channelers. Rounding out the rest of the troop are Perrin and Loyal, who join some of the soldiers in the Great Chamber. Underneath the throne happens to be the Horn of Valier, which is foretold to be found just before the last battle. No one really knows what it does, but we'll have to wait and see for now. Outside the walls, the Wheel of Time goes full on Game of Thrones. Trollocs fast approach, but you'll be hard pressed to see as the flickering flames illuminate a couple nearby, and that's about it. Anyway, they're soon defeated by five untrained channelers teaming up together and combine their powers. They blast the entire army and kill them all. Anyway, the power is too much for the women to bear, and as all them burn up and die, Nin and Egwene survive, with the latter using the power of love, I'm guessing anyway, it's not really explained, to heal Nin and bring her back from certain death. Meanwhile, Rand channels the one power, and gives a big speech about the woman he loves, that being Egwene. In doing so, he manages to use the power and blasts the Dark One back. He fades from view as Rand breathes heavily I did it, he says incredulously. Rand decides to leave, walking away from Warren and not telling her where he's going. When he disappears, Lan catches up to Warren, who has been left powerless after her brief skirmish with the Dark One. She realizes this isn't the last battle and in fact, just the first of many. Back at the fortress, Perrin has had barely anything to do all episode long and here he witnesses Peyton Fain stealing the horn and seemingly killing Loyal too. Perrin can only stand and watch as he leaves. Meanwhile over on the western shores, a whole bunch of ships fast approach, fronted by a bunch of channelers. They conjure forth a huge wave that looks set to consume the girl. So the battle for the fortress, or what's known as the last battle, ends without much aplomb, single-handedly showing everything wrong with the writing in this series. Wouldn't it have been nice for these untrained channelers to actually use their powers ten minutes earlier and prevent needless deaths from the army? If the army knew that they'd be sending channelers out, wouldn't they be the first line of defense? They could have covered them with a volley of arrows from their fortress, keeping the Trollocs at bay while they used their powers. What's worse though is that this move completely shatters any threat that the Trollocs and the Dark One poses. So you're telling me that one Trolloc and that weird Bridger Elm is enough to send Warain and the others fleeing for their lives, but an entire army of 10,000 strong can be taken out with no fanfare by an untrained bunch of magic wielders. If that's what untrained women can do, what sort of power do the A's said I have? There's absolutely no need to worry, because based on this episode alone, one of the A's said I should be able to take out 100,000 easy and therein shatters all tension or threat that our bad guys have. Furthermore, Nin's healing powers also eliminate any need to worry about deaths in this show. If she can heal Egwene while she's nearly dead or actually dead, then why should we care when any of our characters are in mortal danger? She can just heal them, right? It's soul-crushingly bad worldbuilding. And this is a show that's had $90 million put behind it. I've been on the fence with this one all the way through, pointing out little flaws here and there, but still enjoying the storyline despite no emotional connection with any of these characters.
But this finale, whether you're familiar with the book material or not, was horrible. A horrible finale that destroys any threat going forward, undoes some of the light character work done to this point, establishes massive plot armor and shatters any threat the Dark One holds over this land. What a real shame.